Hello and welcome to Emil Short's Take. The late President John Evans at the Mills inaugurated in January 2010 a 10-member Constitution Review Commission to A, ascertain from the people of Ghana their views on the operation of the 1992 Fourth Republican Constitution and in particular the strengths and weaknesses of the Constitution. B, to articulate the concerns of the people of Ghana on amendments that may be required for a comprehensive review of the 1992 Constitution, and C, to make recommendations to the government for consideration and provide a draft bill for possible amendments to the 1992 Constitution. The Commission submitted its report to the government on 20th December 2011. The government, in a white paper, accepted 95% of the recommendations of the Commission and rejected with reasons the remaining 5%. The government then set up a five-member implementation committee to implement the recommendations that had been accepted by the government. To discuss this issue with me is the former chief of staff and legal practitioner Nana Atu Dazi, a prominent member of the NDC, and Mr. Ayukoi Otu, who is also a legal, an astute legal practitioner and a high-ranking member of the NPP. Join us for the main discussion after this short break. <laughs> Welcome back. My name is Emma Short, former Commissioner of Shraj, the Commission on Human Rights and Administrative Justice, and a former judge of the United Nations International Criminal Tribunal for Rwanda. Um, welcome, gentlemen. Thank you very Thank much. You. Um, as you know, the, the, there is this ongoing constitutional amendment process. The Constitution is a very important document. It's the supreme law of the land and it affects us in so many different ways. Uh, it, has, it has to do with human rights, which we enjoy, the relationship between the executive and parliament, and so many other areas which affect our daily lives. So there are many issues which I'd like us to discuss. The first one which I'm going to ask you to comment on is, is this. Some legal experts have questioned the legal and constitutional propriety of using the procedure of establishing a commission of inquiry to undertake the process and have argued that the end product, in other words, the amended constitution, will be a government-oriented amended constitution and not necessarily a people-driven amended constitution. May I start with you, Mr. Oko, to your comments? By the way, thank you. <clears throat> I think the constitution by Article 278 makes provision for appointments of commissions of inquiry. And um, a short reading will reveal that uh, the president, uh, by constitutional instrument, can appoint a commission of inquiry into any matter of public interest where the president is satisfied that a commission of inquiry shall be appointed. And in other circumstances where council of state advises or parliament by resolution requests. So, Going by Article 278, I think that the President acted constitutionally if, in his opinion, um, the matter of constitutional amendments, which involves a referendum, which also involves, the, at the end of the day, the people's opinion, the, 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 there is the need for the, uh, some commission to compile, you know, the, or go out there and find out what the views are you know, before eventually introducing the bill, then in accordance with Article 278, I think that the President acted properly when he set up the committee, the commission, and when he used a constitutional instrument to do the appointments. Well, the argument is this, that not every matter of public interest falls under that article, because almost every issue is a matter of public interest. And so a matter of public interest to fall under that article must be of a special nature which requires the establishment of a committee of inquiry. Mm -hmm. And the argument is this, that the whole process has been executive driven. 
the, the, the government appointed the Constitutional Review Commission. The government then came out with a white paper. And then the government also appointed the Constitutional Re Implementation Committee to implement the recommendations in the white paper. So the argument is that the whole process has been executive driven and therefore at the end of the exercise it might not reflect the will of the people. Well, that could be, you know, they may have a point saying so, but um, you voted for an executive president and he has uh, the full powers of the constitution you know, and uh, the fact that he's been elected, you know, gives him that authority to act for and on behalf of the people of Ghana. Again, always remember that whatever you do, we are looking at budgets, and uh, you need the government's budget to drive some of these things. Assuming we leave it to parliament, parliament will still have to go back and ask for some cash to enable them to do this work. And therefore, if you have the executive driving it, what one should rather pray is that the arguments in parliament would not become partisan to the extent that you have the majority having their way and the minority only having their say. Okay, let me, <laughs> let me, let me get uh, Mr. Tudazi's mm -hmm. uh, take on that. Mm, yeah. I guess since he's a member of the uh, <laughs> present <laughs> government, he's, he's going to... I'm yeah. quite happy to concur <laughs> with your view on this one. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you very much for <clears throat> having me on your show. There's a point of correction. Yes, um, I have a lot of sympathies towards uh, uh, NDC. But I'm not a high ranking <laughs> member of NDC. I'm not a can uh, bearing member. Um, <clears throat> yes, the, 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 the whole question of. Um, Constitutional amendment is a serious business. Uh, somebody will have to take the lead. Um, I would say that the concerns of the the lawyers, you know, who think that the whole process is being hijacked by the executive, may appear uh, um, valid, but really, in substance, um, I think that we should be looking elsewhere. For instance, we should be looking at. The, the nature and the composition of the, uh, what do you call it, or the commission itself, or the committee itself. Who constitutes this? It's a cross-partisan body. Apia Minka it's, uh, died in the wood, leader of the MPP. You know, right in there we have, um, uh, what do you call it, very solid um, um, academicians, mm -hmm. like the chairman, Albert Fiatjo, yeah. you know, Jane Mensah, uh, it's non-partisan the way that he, you know, was. Um, <clears throat> we have Professor Japan, Reverend Professor Japan. I mean, um, we also have Sabe Mark and um, I, I think the uh, Kumbunguna and all that. These are people who you, you can at least quote trust. And I think that in terms of composition, instead of just the form, uh, we should also do that. Now, for me, the. The issue is really moot now because the, the, their work has been completed. They've submitted it, it's been received. And the, you know, we have 984 pages of very solid work. I looked at it and I thought that that's a lot of work that's been done. Very intellectual job, doing the whole, going the whole gamut of the our political uh, constitutional history. And, and I think that they, they've done a good job. But just to well, end up there. Let, let, let me drive on the point I'm trying to make. Yes. The government has rejected 5% of the recommendations of the CRC. The CRC consulted widely. Yes, exactly. There was widespread participation. And the recommendations reflected the will of the people. Yes. Now, why should the government reject part of the recommendations of the CRC? And indeed, the parts which have been recommended are very critical issues on which the people have spoken. So the point is then that the government is rejecting significant recommendations which have been elicited from the public. And that is the critical issue. I know that the whole, yeah. issue, the whole process has been completed. And I don't think we can go back. Yeah. But what I'm trying to get at 
is whether having regard to the fact that the government has reject, rejected significant uh, recommendations made by the CRC, whether at the end of the day it would reflect the will of the people. Yes, um, uh, that's exactly the point I was uh, coming to. You know, you rightly pointed out that government accepted 95% of the recommendations rejecting some five. There are, there are about one or two substantial issues in, in those areas. Uh, for instance, about uh, whether district assemblies should be elected or not elected, you know, and whatnot. Yeah, and the NDPC role and all. These are quite substantial. I would say that there's no universality in terms of how the, the <clears throat> um, what do you call it, uh, constitutional amendments are done and the processes they go through. Indeed, uh, I was just quickly looking at Tanzania, mm. where the, 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 the uh, Constitutional Amendment Committee was set up by the government using, there they use an act of parliament. But the chairman for the, the, well, the Attorney General and the Prime Minister, how about that? Not a good example. That's wrong. I mean, I mean that's all of that, you know. <laughs> and the, uh, the, it was the former Chief Justice was the vice, vice chairman. You go to India, where they, they had a, a retired Chief Justice sitting, and the, the document was received by the law minister, you know, law justice, that tenant general, literally. <laughs> you go to, like, the state of Florida. I just moved that there, where uh, the whole uh, document, there they have a, a, it's a constitutional, you know, demand. The constitution says that after every 20 years, yes. we should stop and review the constitution. The point I'm making is that in the case of India, the, the review was after 50 years. This is not the end of the world for us. The constitutional journey is a long journey. And um, uh, we are now beginning. We may have some weaknesses here and there. But I'm saying that let's look at the substance of the work that's been done. OK. All right, let's leave that issue. And let's move on to another critical legal oh, issue. I'm going to make a, a little yes. <clears throat> okay. <clears throat> suggestion there. In fact, in, when we ran this, uh, this uh, constitution about 10 years, Yes. From 93 to about 205, well, a little over 10 years. I think that Kufour administration also had, you know, such ideas of trying to look at it. It was then spearheaded by a committee, headed by, is it Leo, Leonora Charabantin? Yeah, Leonora was something yes. in yes. charge of some governance, yeah. you know. And uh, I, the president nominated me to write some paper for it. Mm -hmm. To be honest, uh, my view was that. If uh, the American Constitution had stayed for that over 200 years and we mm -hmm. had a few amendments, I didn't think that 10 years was sufficient. So my lead paper was r really to, <laughs> it was Attorney General, to discourage the whole thing, that they should just allow conventions to work. Mm. And that I yeah. believe that things were working okay. Yeah. So we should give ourselves some more time. Mm. So certainly you need somebody to take the lead. And if it happens that... Uh, uh, Nana Tu's party decides in their <laughs> manifesto <laughs> that when they come to power, surely they are going to amend the constitution. You expect them All to right, take okay. the lead. All right, okay. <laughs> All right, let, let's move on to another very important uh, um, uh, sort of legal issue. Now, it is reported that cabinet has approved a constitutional amendment bill which was prepared by the Constitutional Review Implementation Committee. And it seeks to refer to a referendum approval by the electorate of 34 existing entrenched provisions of the Constitution and seven new entrenched provisions. There appears to be some ambiguity as to the role of Parliament in this exercise as, as a, in the amendment of the entrenched provisions because the CRIC seems to suggest that um, after the bill has been approved by, by the cabinet and was sent to the, council, to, to the speaker, who then sent it to the Council of State and has referred it back to Parliament, Parliament is not going to have an opportunity to examine the bill thoroughly and to make changes to the bill because it is a done deal. Um, what's your take on that, Mr. Atudazi? Do you think Parliament would have an opportunity to review this constitutional amendment bill and make changes 
to the bill where it, see, where it deems appropriate? Well, my first answer, direct answer, is that yes and no, uh, depending upon <coughs> which provision you're talking about. If you're talking about the entrenched position, yeah, the my en um, understanding uh, reading of the Constitution means that the uh, uh, Parliament is out. They only would teleguide the process. With regard to the unentrenched uh, portions, they will have the opportunity of actually debating the issues. We will have, we'll go to the first reading, second reading, and third reading. They will have the opportunity. But with regard to the entrenched provisions, from what I'm reading, the, the, the Parliament receives the document for the first time and then forwards it to a Council of State. They will study it for 30 days and send their advice. It's their advice, not opinion, advice. So they are bound, that's it, we are bound by it. Then the whole process will begin. Mr. Abbey yes. does it. The yes. entrenched provisions are supposed to be the more fundamental and important provisions of the Constitution. Yes. So isn't it an anomaly yes. that when it comes to the entrenched provisions, Parliament is going to have a passive role and will not have the opportunity to examine these entrenched provisions yeah, and make changes where necessary. Yeah, but, but, but who is Parliament? What is Parliament? You see, it's a very critical, fundamental question. Parliament is a representative of the people as principles, if you look at it that way. Yeah. So when you are talking about the people themselves talking, parliament peels out. And that's the way I understand it. This referendum in, uh, means that the people are going to speak. So if the people are going to speak, it's not parliament that's going to decide anything. You understand? The principal pops up and the agent fades out. Uh, 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 the whole idea about the entrenched clauses is that we should not encourage amendments of the entrenched clauses. These are the fundamental blocks, you know, building blocks in which our society is uh, has been built. And the people voted for that. You know, they went to a referendum and voted for that in 1992. We are going to go that long way. As my little friend said, you know, the Americans have gone 300 years or so. They haven't changed much. But these are the things, the fundamental rules, the ground norm, which we believe in. You know, these are the, so my understanding of it is that when it comes to the fundamental un, uh, entrenched positions, very little attempt is given for people to debate it. And that is why, you know... Uh, Mr. Yeah. Mr. Yuko, <laughs> sure. Well, the, shouldn't Parliament <laughs> be guiding the electorate? in the referendum by examining the entrenched provisions and making a meaningful input into its content before these provisions are referred to the electorate for a uh, for referendum? Well, you see, my take is that um, <clears throat> the provisions of Article 290 and 106 of the Constitution when it comes to the way Parliament uh, passes laws, you know, appeared not to jive. They are different. Whilst you need to uh, prepare a bill, tell us what you want to change, gazette it, mm -hmm. introduce it to Parliament, is then referred to the committee, is dealt with, comes back, then properly debated, and all that, second reading, third reading, and all that. The, the way this one has been provided for, you know, short circuits the procedure, you know, uh, uh, and, and it makes parliament a little bit, you know, irrelevant. And that is what parliament... And you think that's... Uh, it's not, it's, it's not too it's not, proper, it's not, uh, do you think in, that's in my the, view, it's not the best. Yes. And in fact, um, uh, some Isn't discussions... Isn't this not an interpretation you are placing on, on the Constitution? Yes, it because is. Because when the Constitution says <laughs> that the bill must be introduced into Parliament, mm. what does that mean? When it is introduced, what will Parliament do regarding the bill? And this is no, why... Exactly. That, that is why exactly. it's problematic, sir. Before Parliament proceeds to yes. consider it, yes. then you refer it to the Speaker. So, w w when is Parliament going to consider it? Parliament, Parliament, has, should now, President, Parliament has not considered no, it. No, and no. it's already gone to the Speaker. 
No. So, and so, he also uh, come back. I'm so saying the that. procedures are completely different. And in fact, we've, I, I personally have had the opportunity to speak with some of these drafters and, uh, you know, eminent drafters, and they are of the opinion that it appears that this thing ought to be really, you know, uh, uh, ironed out a bit. It, it's not the best. Because it, it, there's nothing different from uh, passing a law as against amending the law. Exactly. The only difference is the referendum yeah. bit. So why is it that parliament, the representative of the people, those trained, you know, if you like, he knows the number of trainings that are given to our parliamentarians will allow them to understand the issues properly, you know. You leave all these things. And in fact, when it comes to the voting, it's even worse. What are we going to submit to them to, to, to vote no, on? No, if no. parliamentarians have not been given the opportunity yes. to if he really delve into the matter, to discuss it, to bring out the issues, if you don't gazette it for the people to talk about it, you know, over a period. We are talking about six long months, and yet parliament, the leaders of the people, the people's representative are just lame ducks. If you like sitting down, look here. No. <laughs> well, well <laughs> oh, it's you know, I'm itching to, to make a new <laughs> point. The best. I, I don't think that mm -hmm. um, the the way the 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 entrenched clauses uh, provision being the uh, mode of amendment is being uh, structured uh, is a mistake. Definitely, it's a deliberate um, uh, uh, choice that has been made, and the way I see it, uh, it's because, like I'm saying, I mean. If you look at the Florida example, they will tell you, they will say that they look to the citizen of the state for direction and suggestion. For direction and suggestion, not for parliament. Okay. Parliament can be highly... Okay, uh, General, uh, let's take a break partisan. and um, we can continue well, after the break. Yes. Thank you very much. Viewers, welcome back. Um, another important issue I would like us to look at is this. It is reported that this constitutional amendment bill will be referred to the electorate in a referendum and the electorate would vote on the entire bill, yes or no, and not on each entrenched provision. Bearing in mind that these entrenched provisions are not similar, they are completely different, how is it going to be possible for the electorate to decide how to vote when they are presented with the entire bill and not each entry which is for example one of the provisions one of the recommendations is for the abolition of the death penalty supposing someone is not uh, in favor of abolition of the death penalty that person might then be tempted to vote against the whole bill don't you think that this creates a problem? Well, it, it's, it's, it's a huge issue that um, has engaged the, the attention of uh, so many uh, people. Because in a referendum, you're only asking a yes or no. Are you for or against? Is this Switzerland is one of the best examples where they always you know, have referendums one way or the other. Now, it should be only one question. but. Where you have, is it 34, 34 you know, different articles, <laughs> you know, to be voted upon, and you, you bring the entire thing to, to, to the public. I mean, w w when a man votes yes, is he voting yes for everything there, even when he disagrees with some of them? So we, we really have got to think through it. And it's been suggested that uh, even the Supreme Court might perhaps have to give some guidance on this matter. Because it's, it's problematic. I, I, how do you expect the person to exercise that, you know, uh, 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 right to say yes? Say yes to what? And say no to what? Because he may not agree to everything. At the same time, he may not disagree to everything. <laughs> so perhaps somebody must have to take the bull by the horns. Let's go to the Supreme Court and ask whether we are not practicing something on our people <laughs> by asking them to, to vote only yes or no. 
you know. Mr. Atudazi. <laughs> well, well, this is the, the, like my friend said, this is a problem with referendum worldwide. I mean, it's not just here. I mean, the American system, when you go into Congress, uh, a bill comes and somebody is, you know, tax something on. And the question is, do you vote it or you don't vote it? It's a whole big deal. But it's really just a question of convenience. Here we have 34 issues, you know, uh, being uh, old issues being um, and amended. Seven new ones. Yeah, yeah, there's seven new ones coming up. So mm -hmm. how do we do it? Do we have to put 37 plus uh, uh, 34 plus seven, 41 or so issues? Then ask people to take individually. I mean, you, you know, our population. So I think that our our, our faith really is in the commission or the committee that you know does the work and for me i take um a, a lot of uh, comfort in the fact that the commission was very well blended you know balanced and mm -hmm. there are people who know their job and i believe that um it's not like they are thinking for the people but it's not the best but i'm afraid um in terms of convenience that's the only way out you know, and, and you see, there appears to be a, a, a lacuna in that aspect of, of, of the law. There is no law guiding how referendums ought to, to, mm -hmm. to be, you know, uh, handled in this country. There is an old, uh, P, is it the NDC or some, some, some law which had to do with some referendum. But the issue as to what are we going to vote upon? when it comes to referendum. Either parliament may have to, you know, uh, uh, formulate something, come out with a law on referendums, simpliciter, or Supreme Court must give us a guidance. But I don't find it anywhere in the constitution which, where there has been a provision on referendums and how a referenda and how they ought to no, be maybe done. Just, just but, to, but clo this, to close it, I yeah. think that it is important for our, for you to let our listeners understand that the constitutional journey is a long journey. So what we may not be able to achieve today, it's possible to achieve tomorrow or 10 years. And what but more. government runs uh -huh. the risk <laughs> of this whole exercise being rendered futile. Mm -hmm. Because mm -hmm. if people are confused about what to vote for, when they are confronted with 41 different and 20 provisions, they might just decide to vote no to everything. Mm -hmm. Or the majority of people just vote no to everything. And so I think it's a very serious issue that government must look into. And if there is need for some directive or a review of this recommendation, which is coming from the CRIC. But anyway, let's look at some of the substantive recommendations. One of the recommendations is for the abolition of the death penalty. In a recent meeting held somewhere in the north, where this issue was discussed, quite a substantial percentage of the participants were against the abolition of the death penalty. Mm. Now, the CRC has recommended the abolition, and the government has accepted it. Yeah. And this really, internationally, this is the current trend. It is important for you know, the electorate, the general public, to understand the rationale behind the abolition of the death penalty. And therefore, I'd like you to, to uh, let me start with Oikoyo, uh, you have been an uh, mm -hmm. attorney mm -hmm. general before. The <laughs> same death warrants before. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, Possibly. I think the, 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 the main trust there is that uh, you are not too sure of whether the person is indeed guilty or not. But once you say you are found guilty of having done something where the sentence is only one, which is death, either by hanging or shooting by firing squad, which was introduced some time ago, <laughs> you know, you, you may not have a second chance to, to leave this world again. Of course, if you are just in prison for a certain number of years, and after some time evidence emerged that perhaps you were not even the person, you know. You might, you know, in the process, be giving, you know, your, your life back. But once you are shot or you are hanged, you, you go yeah. away. And again, you look at the constitutional provision which deals with inhuman and degrading treatment, you know, putting a noose around somebody's neck like it happened in the...
President Saddam's brother's case, mm. you know, where the news were so tightened to the extent that his head came off completely, you know, and they said it was an accident. But most people felt it was a deliberate act to decapitate the man, you know. This is clearly uh, an indignified way, you know, of, of killing people. So, uh, you know, uh, the fact that we are human beings, we, we can all err, we, 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 we could uh, condemn the wrong person, perhaps it is better that we just give them a life sentence. Yeah. And if in the course of time, evidence may emerge that the people were not even the culprits at all. They may have the opportunity to leave. Instead of saying, once you are sentenced, let's finish with you. So because of the imperfections of the criminal justice system, mm -hmm. you know, the death penalty is, is, is quite, it's irrevo irre irrevocable. And presumably that's why presently, even though the courts continue to sentence, you know, persons to, 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 to hang, mm -hmm. no um, hanging has taken place, I think, since 1983 or thereabouts. Yes. Yeah, it was a policy uh, yeah. that they could be kept, but no, no death warrants will be signed. Yes. So at least uh, during my time, and I know that's what happens, you were just sentenced to death by hanging or by whatever. But it, 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 there is a moratorium that nobody will be hanged. Yeah. I'm, sure, I'm sure you yeah. would agree with this. And, yeah. uh, well, and, uh, well yeah. certainly, certainly. <laughs> Certainly, I think that the the call for the abolition of the death uh, uh, step in the right direction. is long overdue. Yes. I mean, internationally, um, like they say, the figures will show that about 193 independent UN member states. Hmm. You know, say about uh, 41 or 20, only 21 percent maintain the death penalty. You understand? Yes. So out of 193. Uh, just 21 percent of that and um, 95 have, have completely abolished it in about only about eight countries retain it now the, the the point i want to make is that the trend as you rightly said mm. is it's against death penalty yes. and will look very odd but secondly you know it depends it's a class thing at a point in time the people down there believe that look retribution if he's killed he's killed you know he must be killed and i for that Yes, an eye for an eye, two for two, that kind of thing. But um, uh, others have come out with some of these utilitarian arguments and all that, you know, that a person should be given an opportunity, uh, you know, to, to reform. Sorry, it's form. possible to get a person through. Much more with a weak uh, um, legal uh, system. I mean, if you look at the, the, the standard to which we um, convict a person, I mean, our uh, uh, standard, you know, even Jesus Christ, the standard with which he was convicted, I mean, you would, you would, today we see that it was wrong. Yeah. You understand? Okay. Uh -huh. Maybe if other evidence had come in, mm. we would have found out that that man was innocent. Yeah. <laughs> <Who gets me? laughs> so it, 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 it's such a final thing. In any case, who, who benefits or suffers? The person who, who, who is shot dead or killed or hanged, He's gone. He no. doesn't say it. Yeah. So it doesn't benefit the other people. In any case, executing a criminal doesn't stop crime being committed. People are just yeah. I'm robbery and whatnot. So we, we there are other causes of this and you know, in terms of sociology, you know, we need to be examining some of the causes of uh, uh, the, the these uh, uh, offenses and whatnot. Yeah. Uh, crime, sorry. Yeah. Uh, that, Indeed, that the research that has been done worldwide shows that, you know, the death penalty is not a deterrent. No, you know, absolutely not. Uh, no, it and, is not. Uh, and therefore, those you know. who want to retain it, uh, really, their argument is that it will deter criminals, but uh, all the evidence points to the contrary. Yeah, yeah. but admittedly, the, the, the methods are uh, used by some of these criminals. Absolutely condemnable, not abominable. <laughs> you course. understand? You know, of I course. lost a friend recently. Just I'm Robert just went in and shot him. Akrofi, you understand? That kind of thing which creates a world in people, yeah. the revulsion that they want to say, if we get the guy, let's eliminate him. But yeah. I think that we must go beyond on ba on our passion. Yeah, we should. Yeah. Our passion. It, yeah. It's been yeah. interesting that in America, the leader of uh, these uh, human rights issues. There's, you still have states who, 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 which insist that they want to have the death penalty. Yes, but um, <laughs> there's a moratorium in a lot of those states because mm. of recent 
DNA mm -hmm. yes. evidence, exactly. which shows that many people on death row did not commit the crimes for which they were yes. co convicted and sentenced, you know, t to death. And so, and uh, there's also the conspiracy where I hear the the drugs, you know, meant to 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 be used to inject to put people to death. You know, some manufacturers are saying that they did not make them for that sort of thing. So they are refusing <laughs> to manufacture <laughs> more or allow them to be used. Said so that some of these states who really want to, you know, uh, put people to death by lethal injection are even finding it difficult getting the drugs. And there was one situation recently where someone was uh, mm -hmm. given a, a lethal injection and he did not die. He didn't die. Immediately. Yes. And he was there struggling mm -hmm. and, he, uh, you know, the spectacle was it really was the best. Uh, not the best. Yeah, mm -hmm. but, 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 you know, um, there's this famous uh, prayer line that you see being at the <clears throat> right place at the wrong time mm -hmm. you know it, it's it's a real thing it can happen to anybody yeah. where a situation where you happen to be around there's a police action they roll up people they arrest people mm -hmm. and you are there mm -hmm. it's how you arrested because and it's difficult maybe very difficult to please raise an alibi and even mm -hmm. get out mm -hmm. you know Pro, uh, the doctor if mm -hmm. you know collect how to face the uh, mm -hmm. charge of mm -hmm. murder mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. just he happened to have been at the right place at the wrong time mm -hmm. and look at him i mean he took the stand and said look judge me as i am mm -hmm. and eventually it was said you know that he was lucky the jury returned a verdict of not guilty okay but he was lucky okay let's move on to uh, some kind of economic policy yes issue the constitutional review commission recommended that as a nation we should have a national development plan and that that plan should be entrenched in the constitution so that it is binding on successive governments. The government in its white paper accepted the concept or principle of having a national development plan, but rejected the, the recommendation that it should be entrenched in the yes. constitution and that it should be binding on successive governments. There seems to be a consensus among a majority of people that this national development plan should be binding on successive governments. So we don't have governments, when you have a change of government, you know, each government comes and then change radically a policy relating to, for example, education, whether it's SSS or whatever. So that is one area, for example, where I think the government white paper is going against the recommendation of the CRC a recommendation which seems to have the support of the majority of the people. What's your take on that, Mr. Ayukoyuchi? Well, you see... Okay, before we, you answer that, mm -hmm. let's just take a short break and then you could, you have an opportunity to answer that. Thank you very much. Welcome back. Uh, Mr. Ayukoyuchi, you are going to respond to the question as to uh, the government's rejection of the recommendation of the CRC that the National Development Plan should be entrenched in the Constitution and should be binding on successive governments. Bear in mind that this plan would have been arrived at by the participation and input of all stakeholders. Well, you see, there is a difficulty with that um, kind of provision or position. If governments come to power based upon their manifestos, that they churn out, then you're going to have a, a situation where a government makes its manifesto, prepares its manifesto, and comes to meet something, a blueprint of a manifesto already in place. And you're asking him to follow that. The issue is, should we have manifestos then? Or we should have just a blueprint of a manifesto which we have all agreed upon? Let's say in the Nkrumah era, we had things like, is it a 10-year development plan? So we all know that these are the things that go into our development for the next 10 years. Then the, 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 the nitty gritty, so how we get there, we are all going to, you know, Kumasi, how do we go there? By road, through Kofredua, through wherever, we we'll still will get to Kumasi. If we agree that that is what we intend to do. We want to industrialize. Mm -hmm. And we need power, for example, no matter what. You mm -hmm. know, you can't 
industrialized with that power and things like that. So we begin to look at those areas, you know, are we into hydro, into thermal, into this, into that. So this becomes blueprint. It's there for everybody. Mm. But otherwise, you're going to have a difficulty for every political party whether to prepare a manifesto or not to prepare a manifesto. Should we? And what is it that we are going to campaign upon? I find that free senior high school education is about the best that I can offer to the people of Ghana. Now, if it is not in that blueprint, that National Development Commission has not thought about that, what do I do? Should I bring it out or shelve it? You know, so it, it, it is a little bit dicey. And I know somewhere in the Constitution, I'm just trying to find out that two years within, you know, you being voted into office, you have to come out with your program of activities. Why do you place this kind of provision? Shouldn't, you, your, you have. shouldn't your manifesto mm -hmm. be consistent with the National Development Plan which has been agreed upon by all? Yes. So that the implementation of the plan is what might differ. So the question is, where do we meet? When, where are we going to meet to prepare this National Manifesto? The way we suspect each other. We are so suspicious to the extent that if a, one party starts a project, even where the constitution says that don't abandon it, continue, the incoming government takes over. It says, I will not continue. And I agree. You have a situation where they continue and then the answer or the response is, that oh, it is not the original plan. We brought it about. <laughs> then somebody says, okay, we will abandon all that you have done. We will start our own. So the point is, where do we meet? Yeah. How are we going to have that consensus? Are we ready as a nation to, 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 to come to the realization that we have only one country? If the country develops, if it does well, if our city goes down, it affects all of us. If it goes up, we are fine. You know? So if we have that kind of uh, you know, uh, 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 the public spiritedness, that sense of patriotism, that we're going to select people, go and sit at a, 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 a non-partisan assembly, hmm. and then come out with this national development plan for everybody, then it will work. But here, who appoints the members of the national development plan, as it is in our constitution, the commission? Who even appoints them? You know? And any time uh, an opposition figure who could be of much assistance to the nation, who everybody agrees that this guy could assist, is being touted to help. Either his party will say, hey, my friend, if you like, move there and see. It's, they said they can do it, so let them go and do it. <laughs> it is not a palaver. Is that, why, is to that why you did not attend the National Economic <laughs> Forum? <laughs> I cannot assist <laughs> you. <laughs> Uh, yeah, I, I think the, the concept of a, a long-term <laughs> strategic um, multi-year rolling um, national development plan, it's, it's a good quite idea. useful. Yeah. It's a good idea. <laughs> now, we have to locate it in, within our own political milieu. Do you understand? We should never forget that we took a fundamental step. And I will keep coming back to this. In 1992, the refrain when we decided that we'll go multi partyism that calls for conflict of ideas, mm -hmm. competition. You understand? So, we are looking at uh, a competitive spirit. Now, are we not talking about almost a command situation where you say, Well, every party, NDC, MPP, PNC, this is the way we have to go? No, that is not really, really it. Indeed, the NDPC, in their proposal to the uh, Constitutional uh, com uh, Committee, Review Committee, threw up a, a proposal that the, the, the NDPC should have the opportunity of reviewing the, what they call it, the manifestos, you know, of the various parties so they will integrate it into it. I, I think that it's a, 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 lo a long job. I think what we need to do is to define clearly certain you know, specific areas where we say that, look, we won't go there. Like the entrenched provisions we have, mm. right to life, right to this and all that. These are so fundamental that all parties agree. You understand? So 
what we do, we say that we are not going to impose communism. That, that, that is something you don't need a constitutional amendment to say that. You understand? Because in built in our multi party system, it, it completely will exclude that. Mm. The constitution itself says you cannot impose a, a one party state. You understand? It is our political history that has brought us this far. So I think that the challenge we face is that we, we are now in a multi party system. Now, how do we locate this long term, you know, uh, multi year rolling program? And that is what uh, and we should be very careful that we don't end up trying to impose a command, you know, development program on, you know, on party. You, you may never know which parties will crop up in future, <laughs> which will come out with some, quote, strange, strange, strange ideas. Why cut them out, you know? But maybe it doesn't mean that their views are wrong. Various views in the past that the world was flat turned out to be wrong. Yeah, but People were executed. Conventional wisdom. But, yeah, the, but the Constitution so, can be amended yes. at any yeah. time in the future. Mm. Even if it's an entrenched provision, if you go through the right procedure, mm. it can be amended. So in the interest of uh, national development and stability and economic progress, wouldn't it be a good idea to have the broad framework of broad framework oh, but th th then a and then make that uh, permanent and enforceable or binding on all political parties yeah, yeah no but but then then we are on the same page yeah what i'm saying is that we must all agree yeah. on the broad framework mm -hmm. but we must not cast them in gold so just uh, so these are things we could do at the parliamentary level you understand social economic and political circumstances you know, as you go on, and even electoral, uh, international uh, issues may justify review from time to time. You understand? So, if the thing, the situation is, for instance, today, Ghana is tottering on an emerging oil status. I, I, I wouldn't want to see Ghana, you know, uh, uh, as imposing a 20-year program on, on, <laughs> because we cannot fund them. What? will be coming up in the next 10 years. You know, the mm. next guy. Look at the skyline mm. today. Well, the rise and all that. But the broad framework, yeah. I agree. Okay. We should, we should, we should. We should. It, it also yeah. seems to me that the whole idea of the dietary principles of state policy, I, I think, you know, had that kind of policy consideration behind it, mm. you know, so as to provide for various broad aspects. Mm -hmm. If I, I'm referring to Article 36.5, I hope mm -hmm. the Constitutional Pro, uh, uh, Revision, Review Commission looked at it mm -hmm. when it said those things because it is provided for that for the purposes of the foregoing clauses of this article, within two years after assuming office, the President shall present to Parliament a coordinated program of economic and social development policies including agricultural and industrial programs at all levels and in all the program regions of Ghana. Mm. This cannot, you know, uh, coexist with this uh, blueprint that we are talking about. Even if mm. it's going to be, then it should be in accordance with the blueprint. Yes. You bring this, but mutatis mutandis, applying it as and when, you know, they, they are applicable. But a lot of things can be found in the directive principles of state policy, which appear to give some broad guidelines to, to, for all governments. Okay, Mr. Rikocho, you mm. were Attorney General and mm. at the same time Minister of Justice. Okay. <laughs> one of the recommendations or one of the issues before the Review Commission was whether these two positions should be decoupled um, for a number of reasons. We've, we've heard what is happening at the Soul Commissioner's mm -hmm. uh, sittings, mm -hmm. where um, so many judgments have been entered against the state. Um, in some cases, because of lapses in the Attorney General's office and so on, and for some other reasons. Now, there are many people who hold the view that combining these two positions is problematic. And also, anti-corruption activists have recommended that we should have an independent attorney general who is not a member of the sitting government, 
who can have who would have a free hand to undertake prosecutions for corruption where the persons involved are members of the running government unfortunately the recommendation by the constitutional review commission which the government has accepted is that the present situation can be continued um, don't you think that we really sh should have a second look we really should have this sep these two positions separated well thank you I, I, I must say that uh, you know after the committee's work there was some kind of is it a workshop some three day workshop or so at the state house mm. where you know participants were divided into various groups and you know, we met and I found myself, I think, in either the executive and judicial something, something. And uh, I fought against the commission's um, removal of or decoupling idea. You know, I constantly kept on. In fact, they had even said that it was going to be decoupled when I came back and I said, no, <laughs> I still believe that the opportunity should be left to uh, whichever government is in power to determine what he wants to do. You know, my, my worry is this. Who appoints that independent prosecutor? Is it the same government? Are we going to have an independent body to do that appointment? So if the same government, the same president, is going to appoint you know, that uh, individual who will become an independent prosecutor, or if you like, an attorney general, whose duty it is to only to prosecute, you know, then I have a problem. Because at the end of the day, how independent can we be? The, 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 the site is still developing. So you think the, the, you the present situation should be Well, should be I maintained. think we should We're continue. running out of time, oh, so sorry. just a continue. quick response yeah, from yeah, you, well, Mr. Atina. It's a quick one. I'll, I'll we have to round up. Just, just a correction. I think yeah. that my understanding, my understanding of the uh, government of Ghana's position on this was that it is useful, it's desirable, but it's not a constitutional issue. And there's a matter that can be handled, you know, yeah, administratively. Said, Just right? splitting, uh, what do you call it, uh, creating, uh, separating Attorney General from the Ministry of Justice, you know. So that, that's a position I understand. We've come to the end of this discussion. I think it has been a very um, instructive uh, discussion. I would like to thank my guests, Mr. Yuko Otu and Mr. Tudazi, for their val valuable insights into the discussion. And um, stay tuned for the next program of uh, Tick, whoever it's going to be. Whoever, whoever it's Tick is going to be on the next program. <laughs> thank you very much for watching.